Okay, so now we're going to continue on with our human anatomy and physiology chapter on chapter 6.4 on gas exchange. Okay, so right off the bat we see an obvious problem, right? So we're talking about the respiratory system, but also at the same time calling it the ventilation system. And apparently this has something to do with gas exchange. Okay, well, let me just clarify something first. This is the more common term uh, that we may be using, the respiratory system, but we're gonna stop using that because respiration means something totally different, which we'll get to in a while. In order for the ultimate goal of gas exchange to take place, we need a physical mechanism of the ventilation system. Okay, and so air comes in through either the mouth or nasal passages. The mouth is much easier to draw, so that's what I'm going to start with. Yes, that's a mouth. So if you must pretend like there's a human here, okay, here's the nose and the rest of the head and the chin and an eye. Well, that's terrible, okay, but you think you get the hint by now. Maybe you need some hair, I don't know, an ear. You do you, okay? So air comes in through the mouth and then down a very long tube called the trachea, okay? Now, air can also come in through the nasal passages as well, but we're not going to draw all of that, okay? It's gonna pass through a specialized section called the larynx, that's where your voice box is, um, but we don't need to draw that for our purposes. So down through this cartilaginous tube made of hard cartilage uh, called the trachea, some of you might call it the windpipe, and that branches into two main branches. Each of these is called a bronchus, okay? So bronchi would be plural if you've ever had bronchitis, you've had an infection, okay, in here. And one of these is going to go to the right lung and to the left lung. Okay. Now, these bronchi are going to branch into smaller branches called bronchioles, okay? So kind of like a tree branches from its trunk into bigger branches, into smaller branches, into little tiny twigs, so do the tubes of your lungs. And then they all end in these little air sacs that look like little clusters of grapes called alveoli. We're gonna do a lot more work on them on uh, later in this video. Of course, these are all contained within the lungs and you have two lungs, kind of one on each side here. And right underneath of them is a big muscle called the diaphragm. And the diaphragm is gonna separate your chest cavity from your abdominal cavity and do some other really important things. Okay, so like I said, you do not need the exterior portions of the body. All you need is this stuff here. But if you're absolutely dying to know how this is all connected, welcome to my very unproportional drawing of the scary man with the huge chest cavity, okay? So it would look something like that. Now I'm gonna get rid of those so we can actually label them, okay? But at least you can kind of see what we're going for here. So let's label some of these parts. Ventilation starts in the mouth, and then air moves down this huge uh, cartilaginous tube called the trachea. Okay, and then the trachea branches into two bronchi. So bronchus would be singular, bronchi would be plural. And of course, I'm not, I can't show this in the drawing, but these would branch into smaller bronchi and smaller bronchi until we get down to the smallest bronchi, which are called bronchioles. You probably noticed that this is similar to arteries becoming arterioles. So that ending tells us it's a really small uh, derivation or branch. Okay, and then they all end in these little air sacs called alveoli. We'll talk a lot more about them later. Of course, all of that tissue is contained in the lung and is separated 
from your abdominal cavity by a muscle called the diaphragm. Okay, so again, it's really important to kind of separate our, you know, normal everyday vernacular from scientific biological terms, okay? So for our purposes, respiration is not breathing, okay? So we need to kind of get that out of our brains, okay? Breathing is what we call ventilation. Respiration is a totally separate process. And we're going to clear that up now, okay? So respiration is a biochemical process, okay? And that's involved in taking the chemical energy found in your food and converting it into chemical energy in the form of ATP. So we've been calling that um, aerobic respiration. So this involves the mitochondria, if we're doing aerobic respiration. Okay, so we're talking about something on a very, very small cellular level. Ventilation is not biochemical. It's a physical process of the air entering and exiting the lungs. So ventilation is what we actually call breathing. So here again, we're talking about the lungs and everything contained in the lungs, like your bronchioles, your alveoli, all that good stuff. Okay, and of course, your trachea. And there are several muscles involved in this process as well, which we'll get to in a little bit. And then finally, we have the process of gas exchange. And gas exchange is the real crux of all this. It's what we're really aiming for. And this is the ability to diffuse oxygen and carbon dioxide into and out of the capillaries, okay, uh, and the alveoli. So this involves a capillary or capillary, if you're fancy, and alveoli, and of course, your blood, okay, or more technically correct, your blood cells. Okay, so for all of you thinking about doing an IA on how to get people to hold their breath forever, never, never, I'm going to encourage you to throw that idea away because breathing or ventilation is actually kind of important. Okay, so within your cells, you're producing a whole crap load of carbon dioxide, okay? And carbon dioxide is no good. We don't want it to accumulate in the blood, okay? Your blood, okay, or your cells really require oxygen, okay, for aerobic respiration. So that's the stuff that we need. The physical act of ventilation is what helps that exchange process to take place, so when we breathe in, we're going to allow oxygen to diffuse through our lungs into our blood. And when we breathe out, we're going to be able to exchange the carbon dioxide that's in our blood. Okay, it's going to diffuse through our lungs and then we exhale that out. So ventilation is a very necessary process uh, for humans. Please keep in mind that not all organisms breathe. Okay, not all of them do that. Okay, so that's not one of the characteristics of living things. Keep that in mind. We're in a chapter on human physiology. Okay, and that not everything here applies to every organism. Okay, so it might be really tempting to think if I'm looking at a set of lungs, like over here, that these ooey gooey spongy looking things are muscles and that they're capable of just sucking air in and pushing air out. But it doesn't work that way. There's actually no muscle tissue in your lungs themselves to help suck air in. That's not how it works, okay? Instead, they rely on the movement of some associated muscles to kind of like expand and contract the chest cavity, forcing air in and out of the lungs. And one of those muscle pairs are called the interior and exterior intercostal muscles. Now, if you love to eat ribs, okay, then what you're actually eating are the interior and exterior intercostal muscles of a pig, most likely, okay? And these interior and exterior muscles are located on the inside and outside of the rib cage. And they're an example of what we call an antagonistic muscle pair, 
okay? So just like the antagonist in a story works against the protagonist, look at me using some literature terms, one point for Ms. Haas, okay? These muscles are ones that work in opposite directions, okay? So we may not be so familiar with our rib cage anatomy, but I think you know um, about your biceps, and I bet you a dollar all of you are making some kind of embarrassing muscle movement bicep show uh, right now. So here, the biceps and triceps are antagonistic muscle pairs. When the bicep contracts, okay, to pull up the arm, the tricep has to relax. When the tricep contracts to pull down the arm, then the bicep has to relax. So your muscles in your rib cage work in the same manner. Now, your interior and exterior intercostal muscles are only one of two antagonistic muscle pairs found in this ventilation system. The other one is the diaphragm and abdominal muscles. Okay, so here what we're looking at is a cross-section of the body. I know it's hard to look at because I put a picture of David Beckham on the other side, but we'll get to him in a minute. Okay, so here's your spine and here's your chest, so your dorsal and ventral sides. So your diaphragm kind of runs like this, again, separating your chest cavity and your abdominal cavity, and then your abdominal muscles are here. So when one contracts, the other has to relax. When one contracts, the other one has to relax, so on and so forth. Okay, so the diaphragm, again, is gonna run right along in here, okay? And the abdominal muscles are in here, okay? All up in this region, okay? So an antagonistic, muscle pair. So how do these muscles help in the actual act of breathing? Okay, well let's talk about inhaling first. Okay, so the first thing that's going to happen is this diaphragm here is going to be pulled downwards due to a contraction. So when muscles contract, they kind of become smaller, and if this diaphragm becomes smaller, that's going to pull itself downward, okay? At the same time, the exterior intercostals are going to contract, okay? So these exterior muscles are going to kind of pull the rib cage outward. At the same time, the abdominals and interior intercostals are going to relax, okay? It's almost impossible to try to squeeze all of your abdominal muscles while you're breathing in. They must be relaxed uh, in order for this diaphragm contraction to take place. When we do that, what's happening is that the volume of the chest cavity is getting bigger, okay? And what that does is it creates a vacuum. If you increase the volume without putting any more air in there, you're creating a vacuum. And that's going to cause a decrease in pressure and when we have a difference in pressure, air is always going to flow towards the area of lower pressure. That's what happens in a vacuum. So the fact that this diaphragm is contracting, okay, kind of sets off the whole motion uh, or whole series of events that involves in a bigger rib cage with less air pressure in it, which is gonna draw air into the lungs. Exhaling is exactly the opposite, okay? So inhaling or inspiration is the opposite of exhaling or expiration. Okay, so in this case, the diaphragm is going to start relaxing, okay? So it's going to go from its contracted state back down to its relaxed state. And the same thing with these exterior intercostal muscles. At the same time, okay, these abdominal muscles down here are going to contract and so are the interior intercostals that are sitting here on the inside of the rib cage. So if you can physically imagine crunching your abdominal muscles and then squeezing your rib cage shut, what happens? Well, all of the air gets forced out of your lungs. That's because the movement of those muscles causes your rib cage or your chest cavity to become smaller. When we do that, when we compress that space, that's going to increase the air pressure, okay? And since there's a way for that air to get out, that increased pressure is going to force the air out of those lungs, 
Okay, so this will be a lot easier, like if you know where these muscles are and if you try to actually move them, okay? Like moving your abdominal muscles, like crunching them, or your rib cage making it smaller, okay, you can actually tell what happens to the air in your lungs. Okay, so then based on what we've just talked about, you should be able to fill in this table on your own. Okay, so if you're one of my students, um, you need to come in with this table already filled in on your own. So now is a good time to take a moment and pause this video and uh, make sure that you can uh, do this by yourself. Now, we said the ultimate goal of this whole breathing ventilation thing is this gas exchange. So we must get carbon dioxide out and oxygen in. So since the processes are relatively similar, we're just gonna focus on oxygen for the moment. Carbon dioxide would obviously be the opposite. So the first thing that's gonna happen is the air is going to enter through your mouth or your nose into your trachea. It's going to flow into one of your two bronchi and then into those smaller and smaller branches, okay? Eventually, it's gonna flow down into the smallest branches called bronchiole. And at the end of the bronchioles are these little air sacs called alveoli. So the air is going to flow into those alveoli. So here we are over here in this picture in a bronchiole, and then it flows into these little sacs called alveoli. These alveoli are covered in capillaries, and those capillaries are covering or carrying blood. So the oxygen is going to diffuse out of the alveoli and into the capillary. Once it moves through the wall of the capillary, it diffuses into a red blood cell, which is our oxygen carrying cell uh, in the human blood. So let's talk about these alveoli a little more. Um, they're, again, clusters of small sacs. They kind of look like a bunch of grapes, and they're at the end of those really small branches called bronchioles. And we have a whole crap load of them. There's 300 million of these tiny little sacs in each of our lungs. And remember, we have two lungs. So in an average human adult, we have over 600 million of these little sacs, and that's a really big number. Surrounding each one of those alveoli is a capillary. So remember, capillaries are one of those blood vessels that we talked about. They're very small in diameter, in fact, so small that usually only one red blood cell can fit through them at a time. And they have very thin walls, only one cell thick, Okay, and they're where the oxygen and carbon dioxide and waste uh, exchange happens within cells. So we go from arteries to smaller arteries to arterioles to capillaries. Once the exchange takes place, that capillary isn't going to leave, join up with venules, veins, larger veins, etc. Okay, so now before we go any further, let's make sure that we have all of these things uh, straight, that we have the same kind of mental map of what's going on with ventilation, gas exchange, and cell respiration. Okay, so we're gonna start out with air, okay? And this air is going to uh, be comprised of a bunch of different things because air is a mixture, and we're gonna focus specifically on oxygen. That oxygen is going to diffuse into the alveolus, those little air sacs at the terminal branches of the bronchioles in the lungs. From there, the oxygen that's in the alveolus is going to diffuse across the wall of the alveolus and into the lung capillary. Okay, now once the oxygen is in the lung capillary, it's gonna go back to the heart, okay, through the left atrium, through the left ventricle, be pumped all throughout the body, through our arteries and such, okay? It's going to go into one of the capillaries at the end of an arterial, and it's going to reach uh, one of the body cells, okay? So the oxygen then diffuses out of the body capillary. That oxygen is then going to uh, be diffuse into the body cells and be used as a reactant for aerobic cell respiration. 
Okay, so you may remember in aerobic cellular respiration, we're taking glucose and oxygen, and through the magical happenings of the mitochondria, okay, we're transforming that into, sorry, not oxygen, but carbon dioxide and water and a bunch of ATP and heat energy. So carbon dioxide is the product of aerobic cell respiration, and we got to get rid of it. Okay, so when it's in the body capillary, those capillaries, again, are going to join together to form venules, okay, small venules join together with veins, okay, veins join together to make the big vena cava, which goes into the right atrium, the right ventricle, it gets pumped through the pulmonary artery into the lungs, okay, and so while it's there, it enters one of the lung capillaries, and then it's eventually going to diffuse out of that lung capillary, and into an alveolus. It is then going to diffuse out of the alveolus and through the magic of the ventilation system go back into the air. Okay, so what we've modeled here is actually three different processes, okay? So we kind of have this first part here which involves uh, air coming into the lungs through the alveolus, okay? And this is what we call ventilation. And the process of ventilation primary, primarily happens in the lungs. Okay, the next little bit of processes Okay, all involves capillaries, okay? And capillaries are the site of gas exchange. Okay, and gas exchange, of course, wouldn't be gas exchange unless it involved the capillaries, okay? So ventilation in the lungs, this gas exchange, okay, happening in the capillaries. And that leaves us with one last process, which is cell respiration. Okay, and that of course happens in our body cells. Okay, and more specifically, the mitochondria. Okay, so just kind of a nice outline of how ventilation Okay, gives us the necessary action for gas exchange, which is going to give us the necessary reactants for cell respiration. Cell respiration produces products which need to be exchanged into and out of capillaries and then exhaled through the lungs in the ventilation process. Okay, so these alveoli that I keep mentioning are actually really cool and clever little organs. Okay, well, they're not organs, I should say structures, and they're only one cell thick. So what we're seeing here, okay, is a one cell thick wall of an alveoli. And it is, of course, surrounded by this capillary, which is also one cell thick, okay? And this makes diffusion in oxygen very easy and efficient. Okay, so if this wall were any thicker than one cell, it'd be hard for things to get in and out. But the thin walls are definitely helpful. Okay, and these alveoli are made up of two different types of cells. Okay, now I know for those of you doing notes for me, I don't have a box here on your notes for shape. Probably pretty important anyways. I'd find a way to fit it into this box somehow since the form and the function are related. So we have what's called a type 1 pneumocyte. Here's an easy way to remember what pneumocytes are. Site we keep seeing in reference to cell, okay? So cytoplasm, um, cytokinesis, all of these things, erythrocyte, okay? Site means cell. And then pneumo refers to lung. So um, pneumonia, an infection, infection in the lungs. Okay, so here we're talking about some kind of lung cell. That's how we're going to remember those. And these type 1 pneumocytes are thin and flat, and they're right up in here. 
Maybe orange was not the best color to pick, Miss Haas, but that's okay. We all make mistakes. Okay, so the are uh, these type one pneumocytes kind of lay right up in here. They're one cell thick, and they make up the wall of the alveoli. Okay, so one cell thick, thin and flat, type one pneumocytes. Now you may have already guessed the second one, and those are called type two pneumocytes. So we don't have as many of them here. Okay, here's a type two pneumocyte and it's kind of like cube shaped um, and there should only be you know one or very few of these inside each alveoli and um, that's because they don't make up a structural component but what they do is they produce what's called a surfactant so if we don't want something sticking to a pan we spray it with a cooking spray right well that's kind of what your alveoli do with the type 2 pneumocytes is that these type 2 pneumocytes produce a surfactant that kind of spreads along the inside of the alveoli. What that does is it prevents the walls of the alveoli from sticking together. Okay, so these alveoli are kind of wet in here. And what do we know about thin, wet things like um, some wet tissue paper or something like that? Is that they tend to stick together. Well, if these walls are stuck together, then there's no air pocket in here, and that's bad. So this surfactant that's produced by the type pneumocyte kind of keeps this alveoli from sticking together. Okay, so let's see how bad of a job I can do in drawing and labeling an alveolus. So I'm not going to draw the bronchial, I'm just going to draw the alveoli. And what we know is that they are one-celled thick. So we know these type 1 pneumocytes are thin and flat. So notice I'm not drawing them as circles. I'm drawing them as these thin, flat ovals, or at least I'm trying to. I really hope you're doing better than me. And these are eukaryotic cells, so I'm just going to add in a nucleus to remind myself that those are indeed cells. Okay, and again, these are my type 1 pneumocyte. Okay, so within each type 1 pneumocyte, well, no, that's not true. Within each alveoli is a type 2 pneumocyte. Okay, and it produces a surfactant. So I don't know how you want to draw that in here. Okay, um, I'll let you kind of make your best judgment there. I'm going to draw it like this. Okay, and I'm going to call this the surfactant. Okay, and now technically a capillary is going to go all the way, well I actually don't draw this yet, it's going to go all the way around an alveoli, but since I've used up some of that space womp womp, uh, with my labeling here, um, I'm going to go ahead and just draw a capillary on one side of the alveoli. So remember that a capillary is also only one cell thick. And I'm going to even draw it like going away from the alveoli because I'm awesome. Okay. Let me do a little bit better job on this cell. Okay, so it's got one cell on each side of it. So remember, I'm drawing a cross section of this capillary. one cell thick on each side. So here's my capillary. And inside the capillary are going to be red blood cells. Well, and pretty much just blood. Okay, but I'm going to draw the cells, okay, to show that they are only one cell thick. Okay, so here's what I was going for. How did I do? Okay, we have our type 1 pneumocytes making the wall of our alveoli. We have the surfactant on the inside produced by the type 2 pneumocyte, which this goofball didn't include in their drawing. 
And then we have a surrounding capillary. It is only one cell thick on each side, okay? And then the blood cells are inside the capillary. Okay, so one last look, just make sure you have all those parts of your drawing. Okay, so how about this super evil yet classic question? Deduce, which is kind of fancy pants terms for figure it out, the number of membranes, so our answer is gonna be a number, and we're gonna count how many membranes a molecule of oxygen must cross as it diffuses from an alveoli into an erythrocyte. And an erythrocyte is a red blood cell. So for my students, you should be able to figure this out on your own. You need to deduce the number of membranes it would cross and draw an accompanying diagram. Okay, and despite the Eagles missing the playoffs, again, I'm for some reason feeling in a rather generous mood. So I gave you uh, a diagram you can use, but you should be able to count these number of membranes on your own. Now, so far, we've only been talking about normal, proper, perfect lung function. And unfortunately for quite a few of us, um, that's just not always the case. So we're gonna talk about two classic lung problems. And keep in mind that these are permanent lung problems. We're not talking about bronchitis, pneumonia, uh, anything like that. Okay, the first one we're gonna talk about is emphysema. Okay, so emphysema is one of the diseases um, that can be labeled under an umbrella of diseases ca called COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Okay, and it's a disease in which the alveoli are destroyed. Okay, so if I'm looking at an alveolar sac, this is what it's supposed to look like. Emphysema destroys giant sacs or clusters of alveoli, and then it causes your lung tissue, this is real lung tissue, scary stuff, Instead of having normal alveoli, it develops these big gaps or holes where the normal alveoli used to be. There are now these big gaping holes and it's irreversible. Okay, so imagine if you don't have as many alveoli, you can't do as much gas exchange, you can't get as much oxygen, you're going to be feeling very short of breath. You literally uh, don't have the same amount of surface area to diffuse gases in and out. The number one cause of emphysema is smoking. And so many of you youngsters have probably heard that marijuana isn't as bad for you as cigarettes. Well, you need to really be careful about that because while marijuana isn't as dangerous in terms of cancer, in terms of emphysema, it is every bit as troublesome, okay? Anything that you inhale into your lungs that doesn't belong there has the potential to destroy your alveolar sacs and turn your normal lung tissue into gnarly, holy lung tissue. There could be other causes like chemical fumes, okay, coal dust, air pollution, all kinds of things. Um, but in the developed world, okay, we're mostly looking at smoking. And smoking is going to carry over into our conversation on lung cancer. So lung cancer is uh, the spreading of tumors that originate in the lung tissue. So remember, a tumor is a group of cells that are dividing, dividing, dividing out of control. Some kind of carcinogen has damaged the oncogenes that normally turn off cell division. These guys are just reproducing, dividing mitosis out of control. And so once those tumors start to spread to other organs, we call that lung cancer. And if we look at the mortality rates, okay, that means the death rate of different cancers, lung cancer is way up there. Okay, so while you may get kidney cancer, okay, maybe kidney cancer is pretty common, it doesn't kill a high proportion of people that have it. Lung cancer, a totally different story. And the reason is because your lungs are highly vascular. Every one of your 600 million alveoli are covered in capillary networks that are full of blood and can carry those naughty tumor tissues through the blood to several different organs. Okay, so it's spread really easily. There are a bunch of causes of lung care cancer. Sometimes it's just genetics. We have bad luck. Sometimes it's exposure to a carcinogen like in uh, asbestos. 
primarily, again, the cause here is cigarette smoking. Okay, so those uh, chemicals in the cigarettes are carcinogens and can alter our normal lung tissue into cancerous uh, or tumor tissue, which can spread throughout the body. And uh, it's just a really um, nasty, unfortunate, um, terrible end to your life. So I definitely uh, would recommend you not <laughs> use smoking to pass your spare time. Okay, so if I haven't convinced you yet, let's take a look at this graph here, okay, where we're plotting uh, the number of cigarettes smoked and lung cancer mortality or lung cancer deaths, okay? And so what we're really seeing here is what looks to be a causal, no, well, not causal, but a correlation, okay? So we can't say a causal relationship until we do some kind of a study, okay? So if I hadn't done a study where I'm just giving things cigarettes or no cigarettes and plotting lung cancer, if all I'm doing is crunching numbers and looking at a graph, okay, I would say that there appears to be a strong correlation between cigarettes smoked and lung cancer deaths, okay? Be careful. So we want to say correlation, a positive correlation. When one goes up, the other one goes up, okay? We can't say it one causes the other unless you have information on a controlled experiment. Okay, and I'm going to leave you uh, to yourself to really think about the precautionary principle. So we talked about the precautionary principle when we're talking about climate change and ecology, which is that until we can prove that excess carbon dioxide isn't driving climate change, we have an obligation to just halt uh, that carbon or those carbon producing processes. Okay, so I want you to think about how the precautionary principle applies to cigarette manufacturers. So pause the video, take some time to read and think about it, and make sure uh, you take some notes down about your thoughts regarding that. And that'll do it for chapter uh, 6.4 on gas exchange.